month has flown by, taking us into September. Now you'd never know it was September here in California because we're right in the middle of a heat wave. In fact, the highs today is 103. But notwithstanding the weather, it's time for the September President's Challenge. And what do we have this month? Uh, this month's President's Challenge is twice turned. Uh, rough turn something from green wood, allow to dry, and then finish turn the piece. Now this should be a lot of fun because about 90% of the bowls I make, I turn twice. I turn them from green wood, let them dry, and then finish turn them. Now about four years ago, I did a video called Turning Urban Lumber, which took a look at how do you go all the way from a green log to a finished bowl to a finished turning. Uh, but there's a few tips uh, that I didn't cover there, as well as one major thing I didn't cover because simply you can't fit everything into one video, which is the way I dry bowls. Uh, and also there's a few things I've learned since then as well. All right, I have a bit of ash here, uh, thanks to Bob at my wood turning club. Um, I'm usually turning away green wood because there's so much of it around, but as soon as I actually needed a piece for video, uh, I couldn't find one and Bob came through, he got me a piece of very green ash, not sure what subspecies this is, and I can tell it's green just by picking it up, it's really, really heavy. Now as much as I like to use scoochucks, uh, a lot of times with a, a green log this size, um, I just go right to a face plate. Uh, it, you never know what's going on inside of a chunk of green wood, and just to be safe, I want the extra security of a face plate. No need for pilots because this wood's so green. Now, a lot of turners like to round out their blanks on the bandsaw. Um, but what if you don't have a bandsaw? Or like me, I'd rather just do it on a lathe than bypass the bandsaw. Uh, and so what I usually do is I'll nip off the corners to get it into an octagon, which is close enough to a circle that it's going to spin fairly well balanced. Um, sometimes I'll actually take off these corners too, but only if I know I'm going to make a regular conventional bowl, that is with the rim on the cut side and the bottom of the bowl on the bark. Um, if there's any chance I might do a natural edge, I don't want to take off those corners because that's actually part of my rim. That's my natural edge right there. Now I could probably get away uh, without using the tailstock right away because it's fairly well balanced and that that um, that face plate's on there pretty tight. But in, until I start to see what's inside the bark and until I get a little bit more round, I'm going to bring the tailstock in just for a little while. Now to rough this down to get it closer to round, um, there's a cut I use. I call it a pivot cut. And the idea is that instead of using the bevel, you use a pivot point. So either you put pressure straight down on the tool rest that way, or as I prefer to do it, I put my hand on the tool rest and I wrap my fingers around the tool and I use that hook of my fingers to act as a pivot point. And the idea is that I can very slowly rotate through that pivot point and as I cut through the wood, it's a very easy to control and get that irregular surface a little bit rounder, a little bit faster. Now when you do this cut, you want to make sure that your lower flute is horizontal, it's flat. Uh, as you get used to the cut, you can kind of go a little bit uphill just to make it go a little bit faster, but at first keep it nice and uh, level. Uh, the other thing is you want to make sure that your tool, the handle, is a little bit lower than the tip of the tool. And those two things are for a reason. Uh, the reason you want to have this horizontal is that when this is horizontal, this this edge is about as far into the wood as it's going to go. So if you were in a, to encounter something, uh, maybe some metal, a nail, or a stone or something, or just some stubborn bark, the worst thing that's going to happen is it's going to roll the tool down. And in fact, the, the cutting edge is actually going to move a little bit away from the wood. So it's basically, it's going to disengage from the cut. Um, the reason for having it slightly downhill is if I encounter something pretty hard, instead of giving, getting complete leverage, and having the handle come up, it's going to tend to push the tool away from the wood as well. So I'll bring out the speed very slowly. I want to make sure, and I'm going to stand out of the way, I want to make sure this is not going to get too far out of control. And I want to try to get as much speed as I can without bouncing the, everywhere. And now we'll start doing that pivoting cut. So I want to pick my spot on the tool rest, my flute, my lower flute's horizontal, I'm, I'm on my, and my tool is slightly uphill. I wrap my fingers around there, and I'm actually, I actually put the tool right in my hip, and I pivot right into the wood, very slowly. Uh, 
and I'm not going to try to recut until I actually find a new spot, reset, a new spot on the tool rest. Palm uh, planted firmly on the tool rest, my fingers are my, are my pivot point, and rotate again. Now I should also mention, you always want to go from right to left in this cut. If I was to come the other way, now I'm basically going directly into end grain and that could be a problem. Um, so always go from right to left. Reset. See there, there I had a little bit of a bump but because I was downhill and I had that wing it just pushed my tool away. Now I should also mention, I wouldn't recommend using this cut uh, on dry seasoned wood. It's just too brutal of a cut. Um, and it's just really hard to, to actually make any progress with it. see fairly quickly I was able to get rid of uh, a lot of the uh, irregularity of this log. In fact, it's feeling balanced enough. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the tailstock. I'm able to get a good amount of speed now. So at this point I can go back to my regular cross end, crate, end grain cuts and my uh, side grain planing cuts. And, for, and more or less business as usual here, regular bowl making. Time to turn around and hollow it out. Now, you may notice, take notice that usually you want the uh, the tenon to be the right size, such that your gap between your jaws is about an eighth of an inch. That will give you uh, a close to a perfect circle, and you can get your best grip. But when it's green, I'm not so worried about that. But what I am worried about is I may want to reuse this tenon after it's dry on the same chuck. But I'm going to have to take away some material after it dries because it won't be round anymore. So I usually go a little bit large on the tenons when I'm turning, turning them green. All right, time to hollow it out. Now I want to leave it thick for drying because it will warp. And the general rule of thumb is that you want the rim thickness to be 10% of the overall width. So uh, my bowl diameter is about nine inches. So 0.9 inches or just under an inch of thickness. And if you're not used to estimating it, you can go ahead and mark it. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go an inch because that's close enough. And that's the rim of my bowl right there. Now, if you're also don't have a lot of experience hollowing out, you can also use, uh, a lot of times I'll drill out the center to make sure I don't go too deep. And I can tell just by eyeballing it that if I go up to the bottom of the flute, that's about as far as I want to go. And now for possibly my favorite thing in wood turning, hollowing out a green bowl, just shavings everywhere. And it goes pretty fast too, so it's almost like a amusement park ride. I'll clean up my rim a little bit here first. I'm gonna mark my rim right here so I don't 
accidentally go too small. And all the rest of that is coming out. So the second thing you want to keep in mind when uh, roughing out a green bowl, aside from having enough thickness, is that you want to have a consistent thickness all the way down the bowl as best you can. Um, because if there's different thicknesses, it's going to dry at different rates and it could, help, it could exacerbate any kind of cracking. pretty good. A lot of fun. I'm, it never gets old cutting uh, green bowls. Now the last thing, uh, maybe two things that you want to be uh, aware of when you're roughing out a green bowl is that pith right there, those cracks, that's going to continue. So I need to get rid of that. So unfortunately my bowl is going to be just a hair smaller than I wanted it to be. But that's better than having to throw it away because it's too cracked. And the final tip uh, when riffing on a green bowl is sharp edges tend to start cracks uh, much more easily. So any kind of rough, ed any kind of sharp edges, it's good to ease them over. All right, it's bath time. Not for me, although I could probably use them right about now, uh, but for the blank itself because I use alcohol soaking to dry my blanks in about a fraction of the time. I could just put this aside and let it sit for six months, um, but I'm kind of impatient. I want to see the results. Um, now there's a lot of a lot of fast drying techniques out there. Um, fast drying techniques and wood turning are kind of like pizza. Everybody has their favorite, and everybody swears theirs is the best. Um, so I've seen, uh, I've heard about the microwave. Uh, microwaving the bowls, boiling the bowls, um, but one one technique that I've been using for a long time and with really good success, such good success that I haven't bothered try, even trying the other ones yet, um, is to soak the bowl in alcohol for at least eight hours, usually overnight, and then dry the bowl uh, that way. This is, and I first learned about this method from an article uh, online by a, a turner named David Smith, or Dave Smith. Um, and I do pretty much exactly what he does, and maybe with a couple of tweaks here and there. Um, now the big drawback, the big uh, inhibiting factor to, that people usually don't do alcohol drying is that you need a lot of alcohol. Even to soak this in a five gallon jug, I need a couple gallons of alcohol. And if you want to do larger bowls, you could, you could need up to five, ten gallons of alcohol, and it's not cheap. Um, so I thought maybe there's another way because you don't really need to be completely submerged in alcohol. You just need to have a coating of alcohol on it, on the bowl to get it to work, to get it to soak in. So I'm going to try, I haven't tried this before, but I'm going to try putting the bowl in a bag and putting the alcohol in the bag. And that way I need very minimal alcohol uh, to do the trick. And to help form the outside of the bowl, I've actually just grabbed some of the shavings from the bowl. And I'm going to sit that right in there to see if that uh, helps me minimize as well how much I need on the back side. Hopefully this will work. This is the first time I've done it. I'm brave enough to actually do it for the first time on camera. Now I don't, the thing about, don't worry about using too much alcohol, uh, using the whole gallon even at this point because you can reuse the, reuse the alcohol over and over and over again. Um, and even as it starts to dilute, uh, I find you still don't, it still doesn't, doesn't cause any trouble. As long as you keep replenishing with the 90% um, Denatured alcohol, uh, that'll work just fine. So now, just like you're trying to marinate a steak, I'm gonna try to get as much air out of this bag 
as I can so that the surface of the bowl is kind this is this bowl is probably a little bit this bag is probably a little bit too large for this job, but I think it will still work just the same. And the other thing I thought of to help, there's a lot of alcohol in the bowl right there. You could use anything once it's in the bag. You could use any kind of material to try to take up some of the volume inside the bowl. So I'm just going to take some of these beads, stick them in there, and we'll see how this works. Now, you, in the past, since when I'm doing a lot, a lot of roughing, when if I get if I get a whole tree, for instance, um, I used to have a whole small garbage pail full of about five to ten gallons of alcohol, and I would just keep dunking them into there. And you could even nest the bowls. Um, so if you find out this is a really good technique for you, um, and you want to get you want to go all the way, you can get a, get a lot more alcohol and use a small garbage can instead. A little bit easier than doing this. But at least this way, you can give it a try and see how you like it. And these are just some extra large uh, Ziploc bags that I found online. Alright, we'll let this sit and we'll go check this out maybe later on tonight or tomorrow morning. Alright, it's been about 24 hours that my bowl has been soaking here. It looks like the plastic held up just nicely. It's still coated in alcohol. Um, now about eight hours according to the article. I usually end up leaving them overnight because that's what happens to me on my schedule is. Um, you doesn't hurt to go longer, which is kind of nice because if you get tied up the next day and you can't get back to the bowl, you can just leave it in the alcohol. Um, I once forgot about a bowl for about a week and I took it out and dried it and it had no ill effects. So if you uh, roughed out a bowl on Saturday and left it in, couldn't get to it Sunday, got to it Monday or Tuesday, you'd be fine. Pop this out of here. And for now, I'm going to let it dry for about an hour just to make sure the surface is dry before we go any further. And this alcohol I'm going to reuse. And you can actually reuse this. You can actually reuse this alcohol over and over again. Now the the denatured alcohol comes in about 90 percent alcohol, 10 percent water, um, and you'll eventually it'll become diluted because uh, some of the alcohol will evaporate and the water gets left behind. And as well, a lot of the moisture from the bowl bank will get into there as well. Um, but since you don't really need anything that strong, uh, I never replace the alcohol. I just keep adding uh, more 90 percent, and I did that for about two years. And that seemed to be to work just fine without ever having it the, the solution get too diluted. Um, now notice also that the alcohol has taken on a little bit of color uh, from the wood. Um, uh, now as far as reusing the colored alcohol like this, uh, it will stain just the surface, but as soon as you remount it, after drying when you remount it, all of that pigment cuts away as soon as you true up the blank. I've even uh, had alcohol that looked black from soaking a Clara Walnut and afterwards I would uh, soak lighter colored woods like maple uh, uh, and other things like that and once I had it back and it would stain as it came out of the uh, out of the alcohol but after drying it for three weeks putting it back on a lathe and chewing it up uh, all the color was cut away so we'll let this dry for about an hour before we go on to the next step alright the service is just about dry, so I'm going to go ahead and finish this up, get it ready for drying. And what I do is I'm going to wrap just the back side and the rim with some kind of paper. It could be a paper bag or the brown paper that you get from packing. Um, and the theory here is that it, by covering only the back, uh, it makes the out, inside of the bowl dry a little bit faster than the outside. And the idea is that it compresses that, that drying on the inside first uh, causes the bowl to be compressed. And so you get a little bit less cracking that way. Now I used to, be, I used to wonder if this was actually uh, necessary. Uh, but I found out the hard way uh, that it does seem to work because uh, one time I roughed out a pear wood bowl and I forgot about it. I left it to, do, to, left it to uh, surface dry 
and uh, forgot to come back and put the paper on. And sure enough, I came out the next day and uh, there was big gashes down the side of the bowl. I had to throw it away. Uh, so it, it does seem to help. Not very pretty, but it does the trick. And you want to make sure there's air getting into the uh, inside of the bowl, so I'll leave it on stickers or on a wired shelf or a plastic shelf with uh, air. Let the air get inside there. So we have a, a few options at this point. Uh, I could just set it aside and forget about it for a couple of months. It'll be more than dry by then. Um, or if you're in a hurry, you can keep track of the progress. Uh, either you can use a moisture meter and just keep track of the moisture uh, every couple of days, write it right on the paper. And when it stops losing moisture, uh, after a couple of days, it's just about ready to go. And at that point, I'll take the paper off uh, for a couple of days and make sure both sides of the bowl are acclimated. Um, if you don't have a moisture meter, what you can do instead is you can weigh it on a scale. And same idea, uh, as the bowl reaches uh, its dry state, uh, it will stop losing water and the weight will, will stabilize. So once you get the same weight for a few days in a row, uh, you can take off the back of the paper, wait a couple more days for the inside and the outside to acclimate and it'll be ready to return. Now instead of waiting three weeks uh, for that ash blank to dry, I pull out another blank. Um, this is a piece of calorie pear, uh, of almost the same size as the ash. And this was alcohol dried as well. And you can see it's quite, uh, it's quite oval now. In fact, it's about an inch different. In this direction, it's nine and a quarter inches. And in this inch, is, it's eight and a quarter. And so I need to remount this somehow. I don't have this. I don't have the material here anymore, so I can't use a screw chuck, screw chuck, or just a faceplate. So I have to come up with some other way to do it. And the way I used to do it, uh, I used to uh, I used to use this on a screw chuck, and then jam the the uh, bowl between that jam chuck and the, the tailstock. I chew and I chew up the um, I chew up the tenon, and then flip it around and finish the bowl this way. So. I would have to do the bottom of the bowl from the inside against the tailstock. And that's a little bit awkward. It's much easier if I could finish the bowl in this position on the bottom first. So what I'm going to do is that even though you wouldn't want to normally use this tenon because it's so oblong, uh, I'm going to use it just long enough to put some rebates on the inside of the bowl. And I'm going to use that to grab the bowl. Now this doesn't always work. It really depends on the size of your bowl, the depth of your bowl, and what kind of chucks you have available. That is, do you have a chuck that can um, get down inside of the bowl enough to establish a rebate? And it's a little bit hard to mark the tenon. I'm gonna to try to get a basic idea. Maybe right about there. Very gently. And it doesn't have to be, it actually doesn't have to make it all the way around. As long as you have about 90% olive oil in the bowl, that ended up working out pretty well. Since my jaws, my jaws are dovetail, I'm gonna undercut this just a hair to match my dovetail jaws, give me a little bit better hold. Now I have a nice solid mounting and I can work on the outside of the bowl without the impediment of the tool rat or the, the tail stock or being uh, sandwiched in between the, the work and the headstock. All right, from here it's just a matter of chewing it up. Uh, other than that, it's more or less regular bowl turning and it's usually pretty balanced this, at this point. So I can get a good amount of speed, makes it much easier to clean up chew up the outside. One thing you'll find when it's out of round when you're cutting, a little extra pressure down on the tool rest. Never push into the wood, but pushing down on the tool makes it a little bit easier to chew it up.
So what I've decided to do with this bowl, since I'm going to be using an oil finish, is to wet sand right with the oil finish. Um, you can use it. my I like I happen to like uh, boiled linseed oil on pear wood, um, but any oil that doesn't dry right away, uh, mineral oil, uh, boiled linseed oil, walnut oil, um, tongue oil, anything that doesn't dry really quickly, uh, you can wet sand with it. The advantage or the disadvantage of wet sanding is it can get a little bit messy. Um, the advantage is that you don't have dust kicking up everywhere. That's uh, one upside. Um, it also lubricates uh, the sanding. So the sanding, sandpaper doesn't get clogged up and it tends to cut faster and smoother uh, than when dry sanding. And I've used this, I've used boiled linseed oil and wet sanded on pear wood uh, before and I, I like the way it turns out. All right, a nice little salad bowl made out of pear wood. Uh, I'll let this dry for a day or two uh, before I take it over and I'll buff it. And I think I'm going to keep this one and use it for a salad bowl in the kitchen. Now if you've never turned green wood before and twice turned bowls, um, it's something you might want to look into because it, it's a lot of fun and it's free wood. Essentially you just need to invest in an electric chainsaw so you can cut up your blanks. Um, but if you belong to a club, uh, we always get messages, it seems like every couple of weeks a tree is coming down. Um, so there's no short supply uh, of green wood. And you'll also be able to uh, uh, get a hold of a lot of woods so that you won't find in a lumber yard. Uh, different kinds of trees may not be suitable for construction or for furniture, but they're perfectly fine for turning. Alright, so that's what I have for this President's Challenge. And so until next time, uh, make some shavings. <laughs> get, get some green wood and uh, send those shavings all around your shop. It'd make a big mess, but it's a lot of fun.